Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I've got Pastor Chris with me Everybody. here again because you had the opportunity to preach again. I did, yeah, preach And yeah. this week, we're going through our Faith Forward series. You went through Acts 15. Yes. It's the Jerusalem Council. Yeah. Big it kind of feels so. like at this point, we're kind of repeating some things in the book of Acts. Yeah. Yeah, Can you tell sure. me a little bit about it? So yeah, Acts 15, Jerusalem Council. Uh, basically, I, I would I would liken this to like, you know, Canada in 1982 when they finally finished the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in its uh, current form. Uh, this is as powerful as maybe those moments were for our country because what mm -hmm. happened is there's people who say you have to be circumcised to be saved. You have to be circumcised to follow the law of Moses. And this is this is the challenge that's before the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem because at that, at that time, in about 50, 51 AD, that's the center of the church. So the problem is you got to add something to, hmm. to faith and to grace to be saved. And the reason you say it kind of feels like we're repeating, um, in Acts 10, Peter had had a vision of... Um, uh, unclean animals coming down from heaven three yeah. times the vision happens and through that God reveals to him that the Gentiles are going to be included mm -hmm. in the gospel which actually Peter references later in Acts 15 he says you yourself know that by my mouth the Gentiles were to hear the gospel that God had showed him that so this is kind of the conflict this is why they needed a yeah. council to come together mm -hmm. how do we figure this out and it shows us a couple things that are maybe outside of of the um the ideas that we are going to pull it in the sermon today uh but it shows us that that um, the apostles and elders were definitely the ones making the decisions in the early church. That they were mm -hmm. the ones who were charged with the spiritual and organizational leadership of the church at that time. And not every uh, problem was uh, decided in the same way, but this one is clearly decided by the elders and the apostles, and particularly by James, who's the brother of Jesus. Yeah. So that's kind of the setup there. That's kind of mm -hmm. what's happening at that time. And Paul and Barnabas are there. They've come down from Antioch and Syria, and they've met in Jerusalem uh, for this big decision. Yeah. So one of your key points was... Are you living from or for grace? Yeah. And kind of playing on, sometimes we can grasp mentally the idea of grace, but in our hearts yeah. and how we live out, we don't always have that connection. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah let, me, let me flush that out a bit. So, so yeah. the question is, in, in Acts 15, do you have to be circumcised to have faith and to be saved? And the answer was no, you don't have to be circumcised, but they gave them four uh, concessions in, in the early church where you had Gentile people mixing with Jewish people, hmm. Jewish people who understood and held to the law, and Gentile people who had really no law and didn't understand the kind of history and the yeah. cultural ceremonial laws. So the question was, do you need to add something to Jesus? Um, and I said, I said as I preached on Sunday, it's Jesus plus nothing hmm. equals salvation. Yeah. Jesus and his grace is complete because he said on the cross, it is finished. Um, it's not 50% done. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to add my 50% yeah. work. It's not 60. It's not even 90% done. It's 100% done. And it's up to us to be able to respond to the work of God as led by the Holy Spirit hmm. and embrace his grace. Yeah. So this idea of like working for grace or working from grace and... And there's this ladder behind us uh, that I, I preached on a ladder for a bit of it. We're not doing renos right oh, now. There's no <laughs> renos. Yeah, that's right. It's just this little renovation of the heart, maybe. <laughs> that's um, the idea that when when we're working for grace, oftentimes, whether we're meaning, meaning to or not, we stack up kind of our works or our spirituality hmm. and try to achieve grace and love from God. So it's like, you know, rung one, you know, I prayed today, rung two, I, I gave yeah. to the church, rung three, I served, R rung four, you know, I donated more money to the mission fund, you know, yeah. rung five, I completed a Bible reading plan on you version, you know, and I got an achievement medal, like, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. it, we, it almost seems funny when we think about it, but we kind of do it because we think we're trying to achieve something when Jesus has done all the work. Now, all those things in and of themselves are fantastic and good spiritual disciplines mm. to do from the place of grace, not for grace. Now, the yeah. difference is we don't ascend to a ladder to get to God. He actually descended mm. from yeah. heaven to presence his son on the earth, and now we have the Holy Spirit. So from the place where we've received grace, that's where we do things like good Bible reading to, to grow in faith, mm. prayer. That's where we serve. That's where we give. That's where we practice all those things that are part of our faith because we exist now in grace. And I think one of the scriptures that, that I loved that I just kind of touched on as, as a bit of a, a secondary theme, but in the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 16, it says, from his fullness we've received yeah. grace upon grace. And you could say it again, grace upon, upon grace. grace, because usually like the, the repetition of words like that is for emphasis in any gospel or any scripture. They want us mm -hmm. to understand the expansive nature of what they're saying. So grace upon grace. 
And it's from the place when we have had the Spirit working in our lives and we have received salvation uh, as a gift, uh, and it's not for us to boast, as it says in Ephesians 2, that's where we're, 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 we're moving and we're working from grace mm, because we've yeah. received it. Uh, it's like something you're a part of now. It's not something you're trying to achieve. Um, because even <clears throat> my best things I could do will never please God. I'm never going to uh, measure up to what uh, his holiness is or his, his level is. It's because he came down to do all the work. So that's really what it is. Yeah. So I think in our minds, we have to look at like uh, this kind of question we wrestle with is not, not only where are we working maybe for grace, but like if I never read my Bible again, would God love me any less? Hmm. If I never prayed oh. again, would God love me any less? And the truth is that God's love is so deep and expansive that not even good spiritual practices can separate us from his love. Wow. Now, they're good yeah. and they're beneficial, but that's, that's, I think, the question that reflects on what are we doing for grace as opposed mm. to from grace. Uh, and again, I want to reiterate, they're all healthy practices when they're done from grace. Yeah. But when you're trying to achieve, that's not good. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really challenging idea for us as, mm-hmm. as yeah. believers to where are we actually at yeah. and how do we understand grace. And one of the things I loved about your sermon is you, you touched on the cultural clashing Ooh, of the Gentiles yeah, yeah, and the yeah, Jews yeah. coming together. <laughs> and we've got a few discussion questions that we'll share with you guys at the end of this video. But I want to ask Pastor Chris mm. one, just even as a pastor, uh, what your, your view yeah. is on this. And um, there was these cultural tensions in the first century. What are some of these cultural tensions in the church today that you see that, like the Judaizers, trying to force these things on the Gentile believers? What things do you see in the church today that are similar? Well, I would say this. I would say it's probably, number one, uh, what you look like. Uh, Hmm. Number two, how you wear, uh, what clothes you wear. And number three, who you associate with. Now, let me Hmm. unpack that, right? Christians in our culture, we have an image of what a good Christian should look like. You know, obviously wear a button-down shirt, right? You know, and for you, you wear Blundstones, right? That's a good Christian young adult. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not wearing mine today, so. Uh, but Chelsea boots. You wear Chelsea boots, right? There, there, you, go. there you go. Um, so, you know, hats. Hats, for some people, are still a really contentious issue, right? Hmm. Because they see it as disrespect. But for young people, um, hats in, in their dress are very much a part of an identity. Now, I'll just give you an example. No person mm-hmm. in their right mind would ever go up to someone who, with uh, African descent or African heritage when they're wearing a hat in church, a woman, and take it off. They mm-hmm. would understand that would be offensive. The same idea for them as they wear a hat to church and that's part of culture, uh, that is the same for a young person who their their identity, like it or not, is made up more of their image. So hats are one thing, so what, what, we, what we look like, um, uh, what we wear, uh, like even, you know, oh my gosh, could someone have an earring and be a Christian? Um, could someone have a tattoo and be a Christian? Like, you know, I, I think those are concerns mm-hmm. with the exterior. Now, the other one I would say is who you associate with. Now, mm-hmm. I was actually having this kind of conversation with myself this morning after hearing the stock report. And, and for years, um, you know, people would, would rail, against, rail against the ills of gambling. Okay. Now, and it wasn't necessarily gambling. It was really the lifestyle around it. Because, uh, you know, in my own life, uh, I would consider some of my real estate investments because I own two homes. That's a little bit of a gamble. And it's far more than mm. someone who pays $20 a week for like some yeah. scratch ticket. Like yeah. we're talking about margin of huge loss. Um, but it was more about who you associated with. Now, we mm. understand that bad company corrupts good morals, as yeah. Paul said. We totally understand that. But Jesus was called a wine bibber and a drunkard. Why? Because mm-hmm. he went to the people who needed the gospel. Yeah. And I remember a friend of mine preaching one time, and he called it, he used this term, evangelical monastic orders. Okay. Huh. And, and he, he used this phrase, and he said, we've created these. This is where we as, as Christians would rather go to like a Christian restaurant, use a Christian plumber, uh, go to a Christian laundromat and do all the things that isolate us. And we've mm. created this evangelistic monastic order where we kind of retreat into ourselves. Now, I'm not saying anything about monastic orders or about retreating because those yeah. things can be very positive. But if we live our life insulated and isolated from people, we have no opportunity to get the grace out of us yeah. that we received. Exactly. So I think it is uh, what you look like, what you wear, uh, and who you associate with. And mm. it's, it's subtle. It's like, oh, you, should you really be with those people? Well, I think if Jesus was here, man, like, I don't know that he'd come to my church on a Sunday morning. 
Hmm. Like I, wow. I pray that he'd be at downtown hmm. Langley or he'd be on the streets where people are asking for money or he'd be in Wally or he'd be in Guilford. He'd be somewhere where there's people of real need. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's one of the things we struggle yeah. from the church. Those are some really challenging ideas for us. And it's, it's good. Well, thank you, Pastor Chris. Yeah, uh, no thanks problem. for making time to, to do this recap. And if you want, you can go to our Facebook page and rewatch the sermon from past Sunday. But we've got some discussion questions as usual for you guys. And the first one, like I asked Pastor Chris, is what cultural tensions exist in the church today that mimic the Judaizers' attempt to add more onto mm, the grace of yeah, Christ? Question. Second one is, how are you personally challenged by the free gift of grace? The third question is, what is one way that you can practice living from grace, not for grace? And lastly, how can you choose the mission of God rather than your personal opinions this week. Well, once again, thank you, Pastor Chris, yeah. for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. And we hope that you have a grace-filled week. Yeah, that's good. And we love you guys. God bless.